I see we've had a couple more people join. So just for those who have not already heard me say this, welcome to Unit 3A Session 1 of the ACES Aware of Ventura County Virtual Lecture Series. Uh, we're, we're trying to give people a few more minutes to log on, uh, but thank you for joining. We'll get started in a moment. Um, there's some reminders for you um, on the screen um, about today's session. Um, some quick things. Um, we are recording this session. It's actually being recorded right now. Um, and while we're waiting, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat box with your name and organization. Thank you to all of us who are logged in so far. We will be starting in probably just another minute. Um, I see someone else is connected to audio, so I'm gonna pause for a moment until that person's fully connected to give a few more reminders before we get started. So yes, we'll start in, in just one minute, we'll start. Um, please make sure your mute microphones are muted. I think everybody is muted. We know the drill now. Um, while you're waiting, please take a look at the screen. There's some reminders there for you, and we'll give more details in a moment. Um, but also feel free to introduce yourselves, if you'd like, in the chat box with your name and organization. I think we're just about ready to get started. I know people will join as they are able to. Um, thank you so much. Welcome to Unit 3A Session 1 of the ACES Aware of Ventura County Virtual Lecture Series. Those of you who popped on early have heard me say this already, um, but we are glad you're here. Um, we are recording this lecture, so this will be available to you um, afterwards on the ACES Aware of Ventura County website. Uh, please make sure you stay muted as we um, start the presentation. Um, you are welcome to put your name. I see a few folks have already done that. Put your name and organization in the chat. It's good to see everybody. I see Chandra, I see Alice from Public Health. It's good to see you. Um, remember that all in attendance will be entered into a drawing for a custom ACES Aware Ventura County prize. We will announce the drawing winner in our session follow-up email. So be on the lookout uh, for an email from ACES Aware Ventura County. In your registration and evaluation, please make sure you have noted, noted whether you are requesting continuing education. And for those who are seeking CEs, you must be present for the entirety of the session and complete the evaluation to receive those credits. Um, my name is Sharon Elvenstorp. I was formerly with First Five and Help Me Grow, which is um, the group that has been really involved in the ACES Aware of Ventura County um, initiative here in the county. So it's good to see everybody. I um, want to again officially welcome you. And before we get started, we're going to have a few words from Dr. Landon. Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us for this session that is part of the AAVC Provider Training Lecture Series. We hope this session is both informative and engaging for you. Don't forget to register and complete the evaluation so we know who our audience is and how to improve in the future. All who register, including those who are watching this as a recording, will be entered into a raffle for a special ACES Aware of Ventura County Prize. This lecture is being recorded so you can have access to it on our website at any time. 
Thank you for joining us on our mission to bring better help, better health, and better hope to Ventura County and beyond. Awesome. Our speakers today are Judith Druin and Dr. Danielle Shaw. They will be presenting on the developmental and relational paradigm when considering ACEs. Judith Druin earned a master's in marriage, family, and child counseling from California State University Northridge and her BS in child development from California State University Fresno. She is a graduate of the Infant Parent Mental Health Postgraduate Certificate Program in Napa, California, University of Massachusetts and Boston. She has earned phase one and phase two, which is train the trainer certificates from the Child Trauma Academy Certificate Program with Dr. Bruce Perry and the Neurosequential Model Network. She has held a license in marriage and family therapy since 2005 and has 15 years of experience as a preschool director. She is currently in private practice as a licensed marriage and family therapist focusing on parent-child relationships and children who have experienced trauma. She works for the California Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health Consultation Network, formerly known as CIBC or CIBC, providing direct services to preschool staff who have children with challenging behaviors. Most recently, she earned a certificate in conflict resolution through Ventura Conflict Resolution Institute. Through her small business, along with a pri providing private counseling, she provides training to those who work with children, is a conference speaker, and offers mediation services for a variety of clients. Dr. Danielle Shaw is a native Californian who had completed her education in California public schools. After graduation, graduating from medical school at UC Irvine in 1993, she then completed her training in pediatrics there in 1996. She subsequently moved to Ventura County, where she worked for two medical groups prior to opening her solo pediatric practice in 2004. She was active in the medical community and participated in medical mission trips to Mexico and Romania. As a pediatrician, she wasn't well prepared to deal with the mental health issues she saw in her practice. She also struggled to find mental health services for pediatric patients in her community. She felt compassion for the youth and their families who struggled with mental health issues. In 2013, after a medical mission trip to Africa, Dr. Shaw closed her pediatric practice to train in general and child adolescent psychiatry in Augusta, Georgia. In 2017, after she graduated, she traveled and took and passed her psychiatry board examination in Paris before circumnavigating the globe. While in Russia, she lectured to family medicine physicians about psychosocial aspects of rheumatologic diseases. Dr. Shaw has also been the staff psychiatrist for Casa Pacifica Center for Children and Families. In the summer of 2018, she presented a poster of her case series on ADHD and sleep in Prague at the International Association for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and Allied Professionals. Dr. Shaw enjoys learning more about treating the youth she sees at Casa Pacifica. She founded a local pediatric mental health collaborative to bring pediatricians together with local mental health professionals. She is also on the American Academy of Pediatrics California Chapter 2 ACES Committee. Dr. Shaw remains involved in the local medical community. She also enjoys ballroom dancing, hiking, gardening, and would love to someday return to horseback riding. After the lecture, Judith and Danielle will be responding to your questions. You are all encouraged to submit questions via the chat box for our speakers to answer during the Q&A session. Now I'll turn it over to our presentation. Thank you for that introduction. Today in this lecture, we're going to be considering the developmental and relational paradigm when considering ACEs. Now, Judy and I met at a lunch and learn presentation at Casa Pacifica. We discovered that we had similar interests, especially with regards to helping children and families affected by trauma. When I was approached to write a lecture for the series, I invited Judy to join me, given her training and experience in the neurosequential model of therapeutics. This lecture is focused on a child's developmental and relational history to work in concert with the PEARL screening tool. Screening for ACEs with PEARLs helps us to detect ACEs. This presentation adds to these tools to detect childhood risks by understanding how developmental and relationships impact the child's response to ACEs. Much of this material is used in this lecture is used by permission granted from the neurosequential model of therapeutics. 
developed by Dr. Bruce, Bruce Perry. Actual slides or specific information that is from the NMN are designed with their logo. I have a phase two certification as a trainer of trainers in the neurosequential model of therapeutics. Therefore, I am able to use these slides for this lecture series. Yet, having access to these slides through this presentation does not give permission to copy or use these slides for any other purpose. Therefore, this copyright material needs to be respected as such. Here's a QR code and um, it will give you access to the handout for this lecture. And we hope that this handout will be a convenient reference tool for you in your practice. My journey has brought me to a place of passion and advocacy for children and their caregivers, especially those who have experienced trauma. My undergraduate work brought me into the field of child development, whereas my graduate work trained me in family and child relationships. As I have studied under Dr. Bruce Perry for the past several years, I have come to understand children's behavior through the context of how their brains developed according to what happened to them. My most recent work consulting with preschool teachers who have had children who display challenging behaviors has given me insight into how children behave from a state dependent stance according to how their brains are organized and the interactions that they have with their environment and relationships. These are our objectives for this lecture. The first two learning objectives are the same for all the lectures in this series. Uh, number three, four, five, and seven focus on this particular lecture, whereas objective number six focuses mostly on the trauma and postures of medical conditions, which is part B of the same section session. So that we are all on the same page, we will use the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration definition of trauma, which states, Individual trauma results from an event, a series of events, or a set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening, and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. And trauma doesn't discriminate. It can impact anyone, and it may have affected some of you too. It can impact individuals, families, and communities. Parole is a broad sweet view of the child's experiences, which can raise our awareness of potential mental health and physical risks. But a complete history, considering multiple aspects of a child's development, will serve to reveal a more accurate assessment in a child. And lack of understanding of the effects of early, especially pre-verbal childhood trauma can cause misunderstanding of behaviors or physical symptoms in a child, which may result in us missing an opportunity to detect childhood trauma. Children who have experienced trauma can present with behaviors that baffle professionals and parents who might be looking for more neurotypical behaviors. The child might behave in a way that would be seen typically in a much younger or conversely older child. We also need to remember that protective factors need to be considered, which can promote resilience and change the trajectory for the child who has experienced trauma, yet may have a high ACEs score. A referral to a mental health professional or other community-based resources and treatments specializing in trauma-informed care can be a next step in gathering a comprehensive developmental history. More information on this will be addressed in the Trauma Imposters Medical Conditions. As has already been presented in previous lectures in this series, ACEs fall into 10 categories divided into three types of abuse, which are indicated in this slide. One of the pieces that's really important to recognize is that the 10 ACEs identified in this study are certainly not the only risk factors for toxic stress. 
Other factors such as racial discrimination, separation from a parent for reasons other than Now, children are experiencing deportation of parents also. And also there's generational trauma, prenatal exposures. And don't forget as pediatricians, there are medical events and treatments which may also be risk factors. A common phrase in trauma-informed care is not asking, what's wrong with you? But instead asking, what happened to you? We don't need to add to the person's self-blame and shame. In order to help individuals who have experienced trauma, we need to provide an emotionally and physically safe environment and to build buffering safe relationships. Keep physical and behavioral presentations of trauma, which is in the trauma imposters presentation, keep those in the back of your mind when you see youth and, and their families. And don't forget that some of your staff may have also experienced trauma experiences. And if you have had your own traumatic experiences, please make sure that you seek your own support. Here are the components of trauma-informed care. Number one, use a team approach using trauma-informed principles. Number two, Provide a physically and emotionally safe environment and make sure you collaborate with your patient and their family. Number three, provide education about the impacts of trauma, which helps reduce shame and provides validation. And number four, ask about what, the re what responses to trauma the individual can relate to after providing some education on what you might see after you're exposed to trauma. And from there, you can refer to other resources to facilitate hope and recovery. They don't have to live with the suffering. The following questions are important to ask to obtain an accurate assessment of what risks are present for a child who has a high ACE score. When did ACEs occur in the child's development? What areas were being developed in the brain? What environmental factors were present? What relational support or lack thereof were present? These questions can provide context when assessing for ACEs, then in turn can influence what might be the overall developmental risk. For this presentation, we will filter the aforementioned questions through the MMT. So you ask, what is MMT? The neurosequential model of therapeutics is a developmentally sensitive, neurobiologically -bi informed approach to the clinical problem solving process. It is not and does not specifically imply, endorse, or require any single therapeutic technique or method. It is an overarching developmental and relational approach directly informed about the brain, trauma, and deprivation to target areas of vulnerability. And it was developed by Dr. Bruce Perry. Pediatricians and mental health providers who are trained to recognize the physical and mental health impact that trauma can have on an individual will be able to consider the following. The child's history in context of maternal experiences. Let me say that again. We're looking at the maternal experiences for the child's history. So generational and historical trauma, generational transmission of adversity is associated with epigenetics gene expression. Historical trauma is a form of trauma that implies entire communities. It refers to cumulative emotional and psychological wounding as a result of group traumatic experiences tra transmitted across generations within a community. We saw this with the Holocaust and with 9-11 survivors. Genetics and epigenetics influences on gene expression. Genetics, either parent can transmit healthy genes or predisposition, predisposition to mental illness, and other physical disorders. Epigenetics, a parent's and grandparent's life experiences can alter expression of genetic material passed on to their child and grandchild. 
caregiving history that the mother received, this influences the mother's ability to nurture and parent her own child. Also, we want to look at health and stress, physical and psychological safety. Hormones crossing the placenta may cause a predisposition to depression, bipolar, and affect stress response in the brain. Response to inconsistent environmental factors such as maternal heart rate and inconsistent nutrition. Substance use. In fact, prenatal alcohol exposure is the leading preventable cause of intellectual disability. Chaos. Frequent moves, homelessness, domestic violence, a military family, medical procedures for the child or for a family member, accidents, and natural disasters, and support from others. Family, friends, community, or the absence of this support has a negative impact on the unborn child. Prenatal history is sometimes hard to assess, but can provide important information if available. These factors may not be known if the child is in foster or adoption placement. Along with the maternal history, let's look at the child's experiential and relational history. Consider the primary caregiving that the infant receives. We can look at attachment, attunement, consistency and predictability, routines, and smooth transitions. Sensory input. We have to consider the type of sensory input. Is it pleasurable? And the dosing, the amount and timing. Quality and quantity of time, the adults who are fully present. Exercise, nutrition, and sleep. Now these are considered basic caregiving activities, but they, we can't assume that all children are going to be able to receive these. Has there been neglect, physical or emotional, which is a lack of any of the above factors needed for healthy development? Are there supportive adults, coaches, teachers, leaders, family members? Are there adequate positive interactions with peers? Does a child have adequate playtime, which involves non-directive, creative self-exploration, which is much different from directed play? Note, again, that these factors may not be known if the child has been in foster or adoption placement. The following section includes a quick review of the developing brain. The brain can develop in a healthy way with appropriate and timely stimulation. It can also develop maladaptively with unhealthy and inappropriate timing of stimulating stimulation, including neglect. This slide created by Dr. Bruce Perry demonstrates how the brain develops from the bottom up. It includes what basic functions generally happen in which parts of the brain. Yet we need to remember that the brain actually works as a whole, not as individual parts. An infant needs consistent, predictable experiences of love and positive responsive care for her brain to develop in a healthy manner. If this isn't provided, then there will be developmental disorganization in the foundational areas of the brain. If the early brain development is disorganized, the brain will not intuitively fill in these gaps, but will continue to build on whatever foundation has been laid which in turn causes disorganization in the upper areas of the developing brain. Yet, because the brain has properties of plasticity, it is able to change with reparative experiences with our rhythmic, which are rhythmic, patterned, repetitive, predictable, and consistent. Also, you can note that this visual is on your handout for this lecture. This chart shows developmental activity across the brain regions. Brainstem is developed at birth or the baby can't survive. We find that out when we see babies who are uh, premature and they have to be in an incubator and they have to have other supports to help them survive. Diacephalon controls the circadian rhythms, reflexic behaviors, appetite, satiety, arousal, regulation, motor, and state regulation. A baby is able to briefly calm himself using hands to mouth sucking motions, begins to smile, can copy movements, 
communicate needs through different types of cries, may have a favorite snuggly. The limbic system is the neurological seat of emotion, which includes the hippocampus and the amygdala, which are connected to memory, reward, attachment, and emotional regulation. Huge portions of the brain are devoted to social functioning and communication, including establishing and maintaining eye contact, reading faces, body language. Object permanence is starting to develop here also. Awareness of attunement in others. The child may start to be afraid of strangers or prefer a familiar person. The neocortex is responsible for executive functioning. They're able to pretend. They copy others for specific reasons. There's more thought that goes into that copying behavior. They start preferring playing with other children. They demonstrate a wide range of, emotional, of emotions with purpose. They show preferences, has more affect control, wants to please, and shows more independence, able to problem solve in socially acceptable ways, experiences empathy and can act on it understands cause and effect of behavior. If trauma has been experienced during any of these different stages of brain development, the brain functions developing at that time will be impaired. Sensory input from the external world and somatic input from the internal world create brain activity. Positive somatosensory input supports bottom-up modulation. Regulating internal bodily functions, such as heart rate and breathing, will support the bottom-up mod modulation of the brain. Sensory input, how the body receives input from the external world through the seven senses. Those include sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch, vestibular, and proprioception. This sensory input needs to be pleasurable an appropriate amount for the age and temperament of the child and at the right timing. When sensory experiences are accompanied by supportive relationships, healthy brain activity is produced. As the brain develops in a healthy way, cerebral modulation can then regulate the body from the top down. Positive experiences are critical to shaping the capacity of the child to form intimate and emotionally healthy relationships. Early memories, which are developed through sensory input, affect how the person views and responds to the world later in life. If the above sensory, somatosensory inputs aren't supportive and the development of the healthy brain, then the child will develop maladaptive behaviors to cope in his world. A baby that's gently introduced to a warm bath water with the caregiver speaking soothing words or sounds and holds the baby in a secure position will grow up to trust the caregiver and is not not only in this experience but in new experiences also. They will remember the bath experience as one of the relaxing and could have been fun at some point in the future. Learning to swim will also be a skill that probably might develop easier for this child. You know, in the setting where I work with a lot of children who have experienced trauma, I had one youth who had poor hygiene. He didn't like bathing, and it was really a struggle for the caregiver. Then when I learned from the caregiver that he was abused with a high-pressure hose when he was very young, he had a primitive fear response to water and bathing. When he had to bathe, he became dysregulated. Even once he was in a safe environment, he didn't have the cerebromodulatory control to reduce his fear response. He needed to experience new positive sensory activities to develop positive memories associated with water before he was able to bathe without emotional dysregulation. The development of neural networks is based on use dependence. Repetition of experiences activate and develop specific areas of the brain. The more a neural network is activated, the more the network changes as a reflection of the pattern of stimulation.
Conversely, areas of the brain that aren't stimulated will not develop in a healthy manner, resulting in a pruning, pruning away of those neural connections. Also, neural connections can be overstimulated in ways that increase maladaptive responses in stress, reward, and hormonal systems. A child growing up in a domestic violent home can have her stress response system overstimulated. This child could seek out chaos, loud noises, and be loud herself because that is what is familiar to her. It can actually be comforting. She could also be uncomfortable when expected to sit still and listen to a story at school. Or conversely, this child might tune out noises and voices. The parent or teacher might think that the child isn't paying attention, but this child is actually dissociating. They're tuning out so that they can survive. The foundation of this child's brain is disorganized and isn't able to seek the calm environment to relax and even to feel safe. Remember, brain development is most rapid and consequential during the first few years when the fundamentals of one's neural architecture are laid down to facilitate all future learning and development. Adverse experiences can occur anytime during a child's development, even before birth. In general, the earlier the adversity occurs, the greater the impact on the brain development as more neural networks are developing at a very rapid pace during the early months and years. A baby will naturally cry when he is hungry. Nurturing responsive caregivers will respond with food and physical nurturing. The baby will learn to trust that the caregiver will provide for her needs. But if a caregiver doesn't respond in a timely manner, the baby will eventually actually stop crying, not developing trust in his world, and meets his needs with maladaptive behaviors such as hoarding, stealing, withdrawal, screaming excessively, hitting, biting himself or others. And where I work, I see youth with histories of prenatal alcohol exposure and generational trauma. These youth are very dysregulated and impulsive. And at other times, they can be so sweet and caring also. They operate in their lower brains, and their reactive impulse responses are very well developed. They haven't been able to develop an organized upper brain to help them pause before acting. Some of them impulsively take what they want because they learned if they don't take it, no one else will give it to them. What they need and want. Brain architecture is created by the formation of connections between neurons as a result of interactions with one's environment and also the pruning of connections that aren't used. Neural connections are different areas of the brain are responsible for different kinds of activities. For example, the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus has activities related to memory and decision-making and the executive functioning. As you can see from these depictions of neurons, brains subjected to chronic stress have underdeveloped connections, that's the left side of this diagram, in the areas of the brain most critical for success in school, work, and behavior. In contrast, the amygdala, the area of the brain that governs our fear response when, the subject, when subjected to chronic stress, those neurons on the right side of this diagram have been overdeveloped. This can result in exaggerated assessment and response to fearful situations. All functioning of the brain is state dependent. When toxic stress occurs, there are adaptive changes in cognition, affect, neurophysiology, physiology, behavior, and the sense of time, including social, motor, and regulatory capacities. Fear mobilizes some networks and capabilities while shutting down others. When the toxic, toxic stress response has been triggered, one becomes more preoccupied about survival and loses sense of future and goals. When emotionally dysregulated, incentives and future goals become irrelevant, and it no longer motivates a youth to engage in healthy coping skills. 
I have worked with a youth who was looking forward to becoming an adult and attend nursing school. When in a regulated emotional state, this helped her to work towards her future goals. When she became dysregulated, she was no longer able to think about the future to motivate her to avoid dangerous behaviors. This is a visual of hierarchy of the brain development and state-dependent stress response developed by Dr. Perry. When the stress response system is activated, brain function is impacted. This limits access to higher levels of the brain function, which in turn influences behavior. This is state-dependent functioning. This slide shows which neural networks are altered when there is a persisting and sensitizing pattern of activation. The sensitization of the neural networks can cause the person's state to be set at alert, never being in a state of calm. A preschooler or a toddler who is chronically in an alert state might hit another child or teacher just simply by a stranger walking into the room unannounced. She might be fearful and feel like she needs to keep herself safe. Under perceived threat, the brain activates the stress response system, loses ability to take in subtle cues, reverts to tried and true behaviors, becomes more automatic and overreactive, is less able to use higher order thinking skills, loses some memory capacity, and activates trauma triggers. And on your handout, you'll see a listing of trauma triggers. Children communicate what they need through their behavior. A four-year-old boy whom I was working with at a preschool became dysregulated and he was in an alarmed, fearful state when coming into the classroom from outside almost every day. He intuitively used behaviors to help protect and possibly regulate himself. Upon entering the classroom, typically he would hit teachers and children and then use his arms to push all the toys off of the tops of all the shelves. All the while, the teachers were running after him to get him to stop calling his name. Because of the teacher's reactions to this behavior, he felt extremely out of control and he became more fearful. I was asked by the director to demonstrate an intervention for the staff with his child to help change this child's behavior. Actually, we were looking at helping him regulate and lower his stress response. I set up a container of rice with small toys and items to be used for pouring. I put it on the table close to him and sat on a chair near the container and started playing. As he passed by, he stopped. He noticed and then he joined me. He readily engaged in this activity for over 15 minutes while I calmly described what he was doing. He was then ready to join the others at group time and fully participate. I practiced regulate, relate to reason, after which this boy could be involved in others, with others in the classroom. This needed to happen several times with different materials and with different staff to make this a permanent change in his brain and behavior. And this is called generalization. So this boy demonstrates several principles. This boy was in a dysregulated state and we know behaviors are state dependent. So he was dysregulated when he entered the classroom. So he exhibited aggressive behavior. And that was the pathway his brain was accustomed to using, so it's use-dependent functioning. And through co-regulation with adults in the room, he began developing new pathways in his brain. As he increasingly used the regulating pathways, he exhibited new use-dependent functioning. His new regulated state led to a change in behavior as he was able to use higher order brain functioning. This whole process was supported by the development of safe relationships generalized to all the adults in the room. Dr. Bruce Perry developed this illustration on this slide. 
When considering a person who is regulated or dysregulated, note the following. Okay, so in the far left illustration, the regulated person is in a calm, alert state. They have external focus and higher order thinking, and their impulse control is in place. The person is available to reason. They are able to function in the world. Notice the size of the neocortex. In the center illustration, the dysregulated person is in an alarm state. They will flock or freeze, gather with like-minded others, or dissociate. Affect dysregulation or emotional reactivity is present. They aren't able to function in the world with others in a healthy way. Notice the size of the limbic and diacephalon areas of the brain. In the right illustration, the highly dysregulated person is in a fear terror state. They will fight or flee. Motor activity is more impulsive rather than planned. The autonomic nervous system in the brainstem is altered. They aren't able to function in the world with others in a productive way. Note the size of the brainstem. Childhood adversity can easily trigger a child's brain from fight, flight, or freeze flock mode, stimulating the sympathetic nervous system. Recognizing triggers and creating safe spaces can help to buffer long-term health and relational effects and build resilience. Okay, this slide was also developed by Dr. Bruce Perry, indicating that all functioning of the brain is state dependent. There's quite a bit of information on this chart, and so I have reproduced it on the handout for this lecture because it does take some time to figure out exactly how to use it. I will introduce the information contained in the chart and then we'll give an example to show how to use the chart. In the bottom row of the chart are the mental states. They go from calm through terror. This is the point of reference for reading the chart going up, indicating behaviors in each state. In the top row of the chart, are the primary and secondary brain areas in which the individual's brain is functioning. Goes again from the neocortex to the brainstem. The rest of the chart is read by focusing on the far left-hand column and reading across. Traditional fight-flight response, hyperarousal continuum, the dissociative continuum, followed by cognitive functioning, which goes from abstract, abstract to reflexive, and finally looking at a person's capacity for a sense of time. Extended time future to loss of a sense of time completely. This chart is very helpful when we are looking uh, with a child who is functioning differently than the last time we saw him. In looking at this child's behavior, we are identifying his mental state and what parts of the brain the child is functioning in. This this can provide insight into how to work with or respond to the child in that moment. Now I'm going to uh, give you an example using that child that we looked at earlier who came in the classroom very dysregulated. We can identify his mental state as alarm, fear, and terror because his behaviors were resistance, emotional, flight, defiance, reactive, fight, and aggression. His mental state changed quickly from alarm to fear and terror as the teachers chased him around the classroom. By providing a regulating activity that the child could choose on his own to participate in with a supportive, caring adult, this boy was able to move to a calm state. Even cognition is state dependent and needs to be considered when a child seems off for the day or the moment. State dependence of cognition is one of the most baffling phenomena for parents, teachers, and other adults who work with children. The child who was fully capable of doing a task or communicating an idea one day might not be able to focus enough to complete the task or communicate in a meaningful way the next day. And the parent or the teacher is going, they were able to do this yesterday. But look at the chart. 
Notice how the IQ functioning goes down as the mental state goes from calm to fear. In fact, I experienced this firsthand with my own daughter. She was intellectually capable of functioning well. She would show insight in conversation and seem to be functioning at or above her chronological age at times. But when she became more dysregulated, she would fall onto the sofa into these weird, awkward positions and cry out that she couldn't figure out how to get up. She struggled to perform chores and activities of daily living when she was dysregulated. She couldn't problem solve when doing homework. It really didn't make any sense to me until I understood this concept of state-dependent functioning. The stress response system directly influences other systems and functions of the brain. It affects relationships, reward systems, neuroplasticity, and ultimately healthy brain functions. We will be considering relationships, reward systems, neuroplasticity of the brain, and ultimately healthy brain functioning in the remainder of this lecture. Now here stress response, and it's been characterized as falling into three types, positive, tolerable, and toxic. Toxic stress refers to the dysregulated biological stress response and the related long-term changes in physiology. The degree and the chronicity of stress are key components as is the presence of buffering adult relationships. So on the left, we have the positive stress response because not all stress is harmful and some stress is necessary and even an essential part of growth and development. It can help us transiently mobilize energy and increase focus to perform better at the task at hand, such as if you have an upcoming test, a big game, or a presentation coming up at work or for school. The positive stress response is characterized by brief elevation in the stress hormones, which leads to changes in heart rate and blood pressure in response to a routine stressor. But this elevation in stress hormones goes back down when it isn't needed anymore. But that's as opposed to the tolerable stress response, which activates the body's alert system to a greater degree and as a result of more severe and longer lasting difficulties, such as the loss of a loved one, a natural disaster like all these fires on the West Coast, or a frightening injury. If the activation is time limited and buffered by relationships with adults who help the child adapt, the brain and other organs recover from what might otherwise have been damaging effects. Response to stress in tolerable stress is buffered by the protections of safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and environments. Now, the toxic stress response is defined by the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine as prolonged activation of the stress response that can disrupt the development of brain architecture. Did you hear that? It affects structure and other organ systems. And this increases the risk for stress-related disease and cognitive impairment well into the adult years. Exposure to ACEs, in particular in the absence of protective factors as we see above, can alter the biological stress response and disrupt the development of the neuroendocrine immune metabolic and genetic regulatory mechanisms. It impacts a lot. And that can lead to a toxic stress response, thus increasing the risk for health problems, physical, mental, and behavioral. Cumulative adversity is the greatest risk factor for the development of toxic stress response. And that's why we screen for ACEs. Again, the definition of the toxic stress response is this. A consensus of scientific evidence demonstrates that the high dose of cumulative adversity 
experienced during critical and sensitive periods of early life development without the buffering protections of stay, safe, stable, and nurturing relationships environments can lead to long-term disruptions of brain development, immune and hormonal systems, and genetic regulatory mechanisms, a condition now known as the toxic stress response. We actually need stress, yet it needs to be the right kind and the right amount. Vulnerability happens when stress is unpredictable, severe, and prolonged. Vulnerability from toxic stress can set the stress response network, the mental state, at a heightened level, even when there is no apparent external stress present. A baby who has experienced neglect, whose basic needs weren't met, may not tolerate waiting for needs to be met and may act out for no apparent reason. They might be constantly fussing. Predictable, moderate, controlled stress produces resilience, new productive neural networks. A baby that is responded to in a timely manner when she is hungry can progressively wait for longer periods of time for the caregiver to respond to her needs because she already can trust that the caregiver will meet her needs. Vulnerability can happen when resilience building stressors are absent. Helicopter parents work so hard to help their children avoid stress, but when they grow up, these children can't function in the real world because they haven't learned to adapt to stressors. We need to allow children to experience stress that is predictable, moderate, and controlled. Chemicals in the brain. The capacity to deal with stress is controlled by a set of highly interregulated brain circuits and hormonal systems. These systems are specifically designed to deal adaptively with environmental challenges. When an individual feels threatened, stress hormones are produced that convert the physical and emotional stress into chemical signals that are sent throughout the body as well as to the brain. Let's briefly consider stress hormones. Cortisol of high levels over long periods of time have a negative impact on the brain and its capacity to function in a healthy way. Noradrenaline is the alarm hormone, triggering self-protective, sometimes aggressive responses. Serotonin is the impulse modulator. Low levels cause the person to adapt to a threatening environment with an impulsive or aggressive behavior. Normal levels support clear thinking and social success. The next few, few slides list possible behaviors of children exposed to trauma at different ages. Infants exposed to trauma might display the extreme startle response. They could be hypervigilant. If you see a child who has their their eyes excessively wide open for long periods of time. There might be some um, indication of some trauma there. If they prefer objects to faces, or they might withdraw, not wanting to interact with others. Toddlers exposed to trauma might play in a manner that appears disorganized or erratic, not being able to focus, have lack of object permanence, become extremely upset when the parent leaves or a toy is removed, might display resistance to touch, resist, resisting hugs and any other physical touch, even a light touch on the arm or shoulder. Behaviors connected with preschoolers exposed to trauma can include inability to play, especially imaginary or symbolic play wandering around the classroom or the home with no focus, impaired short-term memory, hoarding or collecting objects to excess, food, toys, other objects. I have worked with a preschool teacher who became extremely frustrated when a child wanted to keep all the cars for himself and he wouldn't let any, any others play with any of them. He had so many that he wasn't even able to play with them himself. Let's consider what might be going on for this child. 
he might think that if he doesn't have all the cars, that he won't be able to have any of them. He might wonder if this is a safe place to play without having the cars taken away from him. His lack of problem solving abilities makes it so he can't tell how many is enough. Behaviors in school-aged children who have been exposed to trauma can include extreme urge to control others, the child who has a tendency to be really bossy, difficulty making or keeping friends, feelings of high shame. The child is constantly saying, I'm sorry, excessively. These children feel like they need to keep apologizing, even when they haven't done anything wrong. These children aren't aware of time lapse either. They express concern that they haven't had enough time to play, even though their peers are okay with moving on to other activities. And they don't want to give someone else a turn for fear that they won't get another turn. So where I work, many of the youth are in a residential setting and they try to make friends then become too bossy and are unable to maintain those friendships that they have made. Some families report that their child steals and hoards food and other items. We need to understand the context of the behavior and eliminating shame language and replacing it with reframing language. Reframe what is happening from the child's perspective. Say, I can see that you really wanted those apples. How many would you like to eat now? I wonder if it would work for you if you put the rest of them in this basket with your name on it. Then when you want one, you could simply take one to eat. They will be waiting for you. This will take many days or weeks for the child to actually be able to trust that the apples will be waiting for her, or even that she would be willing to change her behavior. Remember, depending upon tried and true behavior, when children grow up in a neglectful environment, they may not know when they will be fed next. So it is a matter of survival to just grab and hide whatever food you can. Behaviors connected with teens exposed to trauma fall into several categories. One of them is the physical, emotional, social, extreme moodiness, Clingy or re clinginess with others or rejects others, self destructive behavior, difficulty maintaining close relationships. In the thinking area, hopelessness about the future, memory can't remember childhood events, or they have trouble concentrating. Also, there's avoidance, trying to avoid thinking or talking about events, avoid places, people activities reminding them of an event, especially a traumatic event. Intrusive memories, PTSD symptoms, thoughts, dreams, these children aren't aware of time lapse. Now, when youth are recalling intrusive memories, they are not in touch with reality and lose their sense of time. At other times, they are only living in the present and like a younger child, when they ask for something, they can't tolerate waiting until someone is able to help them. They want it now. The handout that's provided in this lecture has more examples of trauma behavior for all age groups. The body is preparing to survive with fight, flight, freeze response. This slide lists several physical responses to threats. Eyes might be blinking or staring. It seems like they never blink. There could be an increase in heart rate, increase in breathing rate, muscle tone, tense, agitated, or collapsed. Release of stored sugar, hypervigilance. Tuning out of all non-critical information having difficulty responding to verbal information or gestures, they start dissociating. The toxic stress response changes neural pathways, hormones, and the immune system to affect health. These are called ACE-associated health conditions. This checklist can aid providers in assessing which symptoms 
may be indicative of a toxic stress response with or without the presence of exposure to known ACEs. And keep in mind that this isn't a complete list as others will be covered in the next presentation on trauma imposters. What we see in the child's body and behavior can give us hints as to whether that child is feeling unsafe or not. If he isn't feeling safe, then we need to help the child regulate first by using patterned, repetitive, rhythmic activities, sensory activities, and we can even use self-soothing activities by making up a, a calming kit. As a child is regulated, he will feel more safe and his stress response will be lowered and his behavior, behaviors will change. Consider the relational health as a powerful determinant of long-term outcomes along with adverse childhood experiences. Early life bonding and attachment is connected to the process of relationally mediated co-regulation. Relational sensitivity based upon early life attachment disruptions can result in frequent co-dysregulation. The next two slides will demonstrate this. This graph shows mental states on the y-axis and on the x-axis over time has rhythm and relationship, can, how rhythm and relationship can support the regulation in a child. A regulated adult can support co-regulation of the adult and child, which means they are both functioning from the top parts of their brains and are able to reason with each other. The adult must be present, parallel, patient, persistent, facilitating, multi-sensory, multi-domain, repetitive activities. Now this graph shows mental states on the y-axis and on the x-axis over time, what can actually happen in a co-dysregulated state. Everyone is overwhelmed and frustrated, functioning from the lower parts of the brain. Remember, we must be regulated ourselves if we expect to co-regulate anyone else. Self-care is essential for optimal caregiving, teaching, coaching, or therapeutics. Humans are social creatures, therefore the neural networks mediating our stress responses reward social interactions, communication, empathy, and the capacity to bond with others are intertwined. All are shaped by the nature, quantity, and timing of early life experiences, especially relationally mediated experiences. Human beings are designed to live in relationship with others at different ages, abilities, backgrounds, experiences, personalities, and interests. Since connection is a biological imperative, chronic disconnection can actually be traumatic. Creating first memories. Our first set of unique sensory stimuli shape neural networks, which will encode and store in our neurons the templates for future sensory stimuli, similar to the original sensory experience. Attachment is therefore a collection of complex memory templates created during the first caring relationships. These sensory experiences can create templates that are supportive of healthy development and functioning or not, depending upon whether there are positive or negative input. The memories that are created influence what the person seeks and expects in later life and how they respond to their current sensory or social experiences. A child who was played with by his parents or caregiver for a satisfactory amount of time in a nurturing, respectful, responsible, and reciprocal way will grow up to be able to play with peers in the same way. They won't be demanding of their peers' time, but they will trust that they will have a turn and will be able to socially interact in a mutually satisfying way with their peers. They will be flexible and willing to try new things. And oftentimes early memories may not be conscious. There may be memories before the child was pre-verbal. I work with youth whose basic needs weren't met for food. Now that they are older, 
emotional stress results in them seeking food, as that wasn't a need that was met in their early nonverbal memories. Dr. Bruce Perry created a graph which visually represents what he calls the intimacy barrier. The intimacy barrier is fluid directly relating to the history of relational interactions with other people. This graph shows the history of relational interactions on the y-axis and the range of intimacy possibilities of current interactions on the x-axis. If there have been positive interactions, the child feels safe and is able to trust and communicate at an intimate level with others. If there have been negative interactions with others, the child will not be able to open up to others. Thus, the intimacy window is smaller. She will also not be able to be consistent with the same adult or other adults at different times. They might not be willing to talk or accept a hug one day when the day before that was totally fine for them. Basically, the poorer the quality of the past interactions, the less the child's ability to interact with others at more intimate levels. Interpersonal relationships can be significantly affected as trauma survivors may struggle to trust others, especially in children where the adults who were supposed to protect them caused harm and confusion. These children may associate intimacy with threat. This all connects back to state dependence and safety. Per Dr. Perry, it is important that the child controls the timing and nature of the interaction, including physical closeness, touch, and sensitive topics. This makes the interaction less threatening, along with setting clear safety boundaries. Be present, parallel, and patient. When you're doing an activity together, it is less threatening if you're sitting parallel next to rather than face to face. Understand that relational interactions can be a child's evocative cue. Relationships can cause intense fear reactions. Thus, trust and intimacy capacity is lessened. Relational health can modify the response to ACEs for better or for worse. Future inquiry will provide more details of experiences, whether adverse or supportive. Poor relational health increases an individual's risk for developing psychological distress and physical symptoms. If there are not strong relational supports for a child, there can be underdeveloped cognitive, physical, or social-emotional developmental domains due to neglect, mismatch of chronological age and developmental age in any of the developmental domains. There can be an overdeveloped stress response system. The intimacy barrier can be skewed towards self-protection, resistance to intimacy, even misunderstanding other people's engagement attempts, difficulties with sensory integration, and difficulty regulating behavior. Top-down control of behavior. The function of the prefrontal cortex is to control behavior. It's linked to the Olympic, the brainstem, the body, and input from the relational world. It needs to be well-developed for executive functioning. Executive functioning includes monitoring behavior, problem solving, attention, decision making, task switching, and impulse control. In review, Remember the example presented earlier in the slide of the four-year-old boy who became dysregulated when he came into the classroom from outside? That example reminds us of how we can help children become regulated so they can engage with their world. To engage with other human beings is a meaningful way. Both people must be regulated and have established some sort of connection or relationship. When they are able to actively listen to each other, reason with each other, and reflect on the interaction between the two of them. Brain plasticity, the malleability and adaptability quality of the brain, gives hope to caregivers of children with high ACEs scores. Nurturing responsive reciprocal care drives the experiential process of brain and central nervous system development in a healthy way. 
supports the reparative process that the brain needs to develop the connections for organized brain development. Note, the timetable of brain plasticity varies. It is narrow for basic sensory abilities and wider for language and broadest for cognitive and social emotional skills. Potential for change is greatest at the top of the brain than at the bottom of the brain as the person ages. As caregivers gain hope, they won't be likely to feed into learned helplessness or defeatist reactions of their children. Remember characteristics of a good caregiver. They're present, they're attentive, they're attuned, and they're responsive. Remember it is easier and less costly to form strong brain circuits during the early years than it is to intervene or fix them later. But it can be done at any age because of brain plasticity. Starting with the brainstem, we need to make sure that the child is regulated in order for him to benefit from any intervention activities. Therefore, patterned, repetitive, rhythmic activities that are relevant, respectful, and rewarding, all within a supportive relationship, will heal the brain and increase physical and mental health. We need to stimulate healthy reward systems in the brain with sensitizations of safety, music, rhythm, and positive human interaction. These are the core strengths that Dr. Perry promotes to support healthy development in children. His articles, books, website, YouTube videos give examples of how to think and work with children in order for them to develop these core strengths. Each person has a unique pathway to the present and deserves individualized care. One size fits all approaches rarely meet the needs of the individual. More often, they're there to meet the needs of the provider or the system. As we use Pearl's screening tool, let's remember the child's unique life experiences that contribute to her risk assessment and not simply look at the score at the bottom of the screening. So thank you for joining us and participating in our presentation. We hope that these slides and these presentations will be helpful for you and very practical as you use the information that you received to work with your clients. Thank you, Judith and Danielle, for that really informative presentation. Um, so I'm going to take a few moments now to read some important reminders um, about ACES training, a certification, and screening, um, and then we'll do our Q&A portion. So in terms of how to get certified to screen for ACEs, um, clinical team members who bill Medi-Cal must complete a certified ACEs Aware core training and attest to completing the training to qualify to receive Medi-Cal payment for conducting ACE screenings. Um, the Becoming ACEs Aware in California training is a free two-hour online training that certifies eligible clinicians to receive Medi-Cal payment for ACE screenings. Clinicians and clinical team members will receive two continuing medical education or CME credits and two maintenance of certification or MOC credits upon completion and are encouraged to join the ACEs Aware clinician directory. And you can see the website listed there if you're interested in becoming certified to screen for ACEs. So we're now going to start the Q&A portion of this presentation. You are encouraged, if you have not already, to submit your questions via the chat box for our presenters to answer during this time. You may also raise your hand, um, which is on the bottom of your screen if you're on Zoom, um, the, the raise your hand function, and we'll call on you and have you unmute um, when we're ready for you. And again, you can continue to type your questions into the chat box as we go along. So we are now going to get started. I'm going to check that I haven't missed any questions in the chat. We do, looks like we have a question from um, Jessica who asks, why do we only look at the maternal history for risk factors? Actually, we look at more than the maternal risk factors 
Um, we focused on it a lot because I know in my own experience, I hadn't really considered prenatal adversity and intergenerational trauma, epigenetics. Um, many of the other trainings focus on the ACEs screening and the PEARLS tool. So that definite, there's definitely more to the <laughs> what's happening than um, the, what happened to the mother. Yeah, in fact, I'm sorry if we gave that impression that we only look at the maternal history, but typically the maternal history is going to be the most significant, especially you know, pre-birth, because that's the influence that the mother has upon uh, the baby developing inside of her. And so that's part of the reason why we focused on that. There is so much more that we could share with you, and we've really had to cut out a lot of a lot of information to get through this. But thanks for the question; it was excellent. Yes, and also in the trauma, this is a two-part series, and in the trauma imposters lecture, which is next, um, there's a little bit more details of risk factors too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions and reminder, you can also um, raise your hand that's on the reactions button on the bottom of your screen. And there should just be a button that says raise your hand and we can call on you if you'd like to unmute or put your question in the chat. And I did see Kathleen, I see your question about um, showing the slide with the QR code again, and I'm pretty sure we're going to do that in a moment. Um, any other questions? So we have another question that asks, um, how can we support a woman's pregnancy through ACEs education? Are there ways that a woman's health team, so the primary care doctor, the OBGYN and pediatrician can work together to ensure that the mother is accurately assessed and treated for both past and current trauma? That's a good question and a very comprehensive one. There's always a role for education during pregnancy and when you're seeing children in your clinics. And it's real important when you ask about trauma to use language where you're removing the blame and shame. Um, and my passion is actually on collaboration. And when you're talking about OBGYNs, working together with pediatricians, family practice physicians, I think it's really important that information gets transmitted from one team to the next and that there's education um, we need to include the OBGYN so that they ask these questions about what's happening during the pregnancy. And, oh, go ahead, Judy. <laughs> I was just gonna say, this is a process. And so we don't necessarily have to go, oh my goodness, we have to make sure that we've assessed the mother completely and then we have to treat her. It's just the beginnings of trying to figure out what's going on and what's contributing or possibly contributing to the child and the health of the child. And so if we're suspecting or wondering if the mom has had some trauma in her past, then we want to be alerted to that. And then we want to be sensitive. And when she wants to share it, that's when we can deal with it. And one of the issues with um, revealing like substance use or things during, during pregnancy is there's a lot of stigma associated mm -hmm. with it. And I know in my earlier pediatric years, I was fairly judgmental. How could someone do that while they're pregnant? Don't they know what they're doing to their child? And we have to remove some of that judgment and stigma because there's something going on in the mom's life that's leading to using substances or being in a bad situation, or maybe it's poverty and they live in a crime ridden neighborhood and that causes a lot of stress. So we need to ask, and also in a recent AAP conference I attended, there's sometimes some legal issues where mothers can be um, reported for child abuse for prenatal substance exposure, and that's really unfortunate. We need to focus on helping them through this and addressing barriers to keep them from getting help and walk alongside them. In fact, what you're sharing, Danielle, I think of what happened to you 
instead of what's wrong with you. And so we wanna keep that in mind as we work with these moms and say, how can I support you? How can I come alongside you so that you are free and you trust me so that you can get the help that you need and the support that you need. Great. Um, any other questions? Yes, and feel free to unmute and raise your hand to ask your questions if you have them. But I do like the points you're making, Danielle and Judith, about um, that intergenerational trauma and, of course, the need to support the parents and the child, right? Especially if we're looking at trying to cut, um, you know, ACEs in half within one generation, we have to be looking at big picture and everyone involved. So thank you. Another question has come in. It says, due to COVID, many of our children experience a gap in school time and perhaps more importantly, a gap in protective factors, such as positive, nurturing, relational supports. How do you see the ACEs screening being part of the solution? Well, one of the things that we think about is that the ACEs screening does look at cumulative effects and uh, and how that uh, the adversity does affect the, the child. And so that can that can help us uh, figure out, is this a one time thing or has this been happening maybe over generations? And so that's going to alert us in terms of where to focus and how to work with these with these families. At the same time, we want to always bring hope. We don't want to go, aha, this is what happened. But we want to bring hope and say that there's always hope to do things differently and I'm here to support you or I'm going to refer you to somebody who can support you in a way that will be meaningful to you. And if you're doing the screening and asking questions about substance use in the home, that's one of the questions. COVID has been really stressful. Mm -hmm. And maybe this is one way of asking questions. And if they're comfortable responding in the affirmative, this is an opportunity to intervene. And as Judy said, to bring hope. I'm particularly interested in this question, not to take up too much time with what I have to say, but, um, you know, because I'm currently working for the Ventura County SELPA and the County Office of Education position to support kids who are having some challenges, whether it was from COVID or other reasons. And so I think this is a very um, topical thing. And I like the work that we're seeing that's happening. We're looking at some true cross-sector collaboration as well between the healthcare community, our educational community and other sectors. So um, I appreciate that answer. Yes, Jessica, absolutely, it's okay if you have another question. Um, so um, Jessica's asking, or said, I like what you said about understanding behavior with trauma. Any idea on how to explain excessive lying? That's a really good question. And that is so hard with the youth that I've worked with. Sometimes there's lying because they've learned that that's the right thing to do. Otherwise, maybe they'll get beat up or excessively punished. And sometimes lying isn't intentionally lying. It can be what we call confabulation. You ask a question to a child and they don't know how to answer and they just make something up to and they can be very creative in their responses. It can really be amazing. But sometimes lying's been a survival skill when they've been in a difficult situation. And just like even with stealing, okay, I see this pen here. Oh, this doesn't work on this, but no one's holding it. If no one's touching it or using it, it doesn't belong to anyone, it's mine and they don't see that as stealing. So some of their perceptions are different of what they're doing. And in, in my experience with children lying, I always look at the underlying uh, message that they're trying to give me. And I'm suspecting that they're probably not feeling safe. So whatever I can say so that I can stay safe is what I'm going to say. I don't care whether it's lying or not. I just wanna stay safe. Thank you for that. So I think we have time for one more question. So if you have a burning question that you'd like to either post in the chat or again, raise your hand or unmute yourself, uh, now is your chance. And I just thought of one more response to Jessica's question as we're sitting here. 
what has been modeled for the child. Children learn from what you do more than what you say. And if parents routinely lied around them and they heard them lying, that's kind of normalized for them. So they don't see that as a big deal. So this will be our final question for our presenters, our speakers. When parents are coming to grips with their own traumas and learning about their own dysregulation, how much do we go into the effects of their dysregulation on their child? I think this is again where we want to stop and say, how we deal with this is going to make a difference on how the parent feels about themselves and whether they want to trust us. So number one, we need to give them hope. We don't wanna get into blaming. We want to answer their questions in an honest way, but at the same time, we don't need to scare them. We need to focus on the fact that we can repair the relationship just as if the skin is cut and then it heals, that scar is very strong. It's stronger than maybe the surrounding skin. It's the same way with a repaired relationship. It's not that the relationship is doomed because there were some problems or some dysregulation the parents were, were displaying with the child, but it's how they repair that relationship and that they do repair that relationship, that that relationship can actually be stronger. And so, we want to make sure that we give parents hope, that they never have to give up, that they can always look forward to something new and different. And then at the end of our presentation, we did talk about the brain plasticity and how that can change for the adult and for the child. Yeah, and I found psychoeducation to be such a powerful tool mm -hmm. for the youth and their parents. It takes away some of the blame there's something that I learned that I think is really important and is recognizing when someone can't versus they won't. When we see parents or the children doing something that they shouldn't, we tell them to stop that. And sometimes they can't. We just learned about how the brain functions differently in response to trauma. You have to develop new pathways. The amygdala is huge. The hippocampus and prefrontal cortex are small. It takes time to change the structure of the brain and the pathways. And if they understand, oh, that's why they do that. And this is how we can help build the pathways to help with that. That brings the hope. I think that's a good place to end with both what Danielle and Judith just said about hope, right? That that's giving parents hope, giving ourselves hope as professionals who are supporting families and children that um, we can change and we can start to cut trauma in half within one generation. So with that, I thank everyone for participating. Thank you so much for these really thoughtful questions. I hope everyone feels more equipped to examine the individual's brain and body development in the context of a screening treatment. Um, thank you again to, um, our speakers, um, Judith and Danielle, um, for this evening. Please stay on for some important reminders from the Land and Pediatric Foundation ACES grant coordinators. Thank you again for watching this lecture. Remember to complete the registration and evaluation. We will contact you soon if you are one of our raffle winners, so stay tuned. Make sure to follow us on all our social media accounts and subscribe on our webpage for more information of our 12 lecture series, ACES Aware of Ventura County, and all things ACES Aware. Thank you for joining us on our mission to bring better help, better health, and better hope to Ventura County and beyond. Bye. Bye. See, See you at our next session. session. Thank you all again for joining this session. Um, as a reminder, part B of this presentation with uh, Danielle and Judith, once again, as our presenters will be next week on uh, November 5th. That will be going over the trauma imposters of behavioral and physical presentations of trauma. 
Um, and then again, we do have the evaluation QR code here on the screen, as well as the handout QR code, which we will be sending as a follow-up email as well. And then keep an eye out on your inboxes uh, to find out who is this session's drawing winner. And good luck to you. Um, and hopefully we see you on next week. And thank you again to Sharon, Danielle, and Judith. Have a great night.